so I didn't want to do this without Dina, so I'm having Dina come up. Uh, we just wanted to give a couple words on, we're really pleased to be embarking, or I'm pleased to have Dina embarking on this uh, research project. And one of the things, a theme that I've heard over and over again working with endowments and foundations is that when they approach, or when someone who's interested in sustainable investing or ESG approaches the investment team, they oftentimes get turned away or shut down because of the word sustainable or ESG, and they'll just shut them off. And what I've discovered is that there's been a shift in the industry because ESG analysts are now starting to speak the language of investment people, people with a CFA. And I think the research that Dina is embarking on is really going to further that much more by basing a lot of this research in academic research from top universities in the United States. So I'll just, that's my little introduction, and just let Dina talk a little bit more about the research that she's embarking on. Emphasis embarking. So first of all, thanks for having us. And for me, it was a real privilege to be here. So I think there's a lot of enthusiasm in this group. And I think together, we can make a difference. And that's my purpose at UBS, is to actually try to make that difference and try to make what we are doing more real, more real in the sense of what are we doing to further the notion of sustainability. And in my world, that right now means human lives and ecosystem quality. So the research itself. Um, we will start as of next year, and we're working together with Harvard School of Public Health. And uh, with Harvard, we're going to work on two themes that were given to us by our pension fund partner. That's climate change. So we're going to start modeling, ex excitement here, modeling the, um, the impact of climate change on human health and the ecosystem. And then also uh, health in the notion of health and well-being of, uh, of employees, but also in terms of healthcare products and how that improves lives. So that's Harvard. That's climate change and health. And then the other theme is water. So for the water research, we're teaming up with City University of New York, who has developed an amazing global water model. They pull from 23 databases including satellite data, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think this is awesome. And with them to look at water impacts on human well-being downstream and the ecosystem. And the third, uh, excuse me, the fourth, fourth theme we will work on is food security. And uh, for this one, I'm a little bit more hesitant to launch into it full tilt right now. We want to work on climate and water, which are the building blocks of food security, if you think about it. But those are the things we will be working on. And this is not something that I know our pension fund partners want this to become part of how they approach their entire assets, several billions, dollar, billions of euros, I should say, worth of assets. So they see this as something that they would like to apply across the board, and that's huge. And from my perspective, I would like to see UBS applying this across the board in all our investments so that we start to become more down to earth in terms of the um, sustainability of what it is we do. So that's the ambition. We're not going to do this in a bubble. So I think as we go along, I would love to get more people involved, at least as sounding boards, as to what we are trying to do. Because if we do it right, it should work across the board. And that's the ambition. So thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you both so much. So one Quick last announcement, I just wanted to mention that the event is carbon neutral and to thank our, uh, our sponsors there, South Pole Carbon, um, for providing the offsets and a little bit about the, the project uh, where those offsets come from. Um, you know, we think it is important to the extent we can to, to walk the talk in that. So I wanted to mention that as well and thank South Pole and, and Stephen Schofield who's here from South Pole. Um, and with that, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, a man for many of you who needs no introduction. Um, and I won't go into too much detail because you do have his full bio um, and his list of many accomplishments in your journal. Um, but I'm very excited uh, that Bob Litterman will be joining us tonight and sharing his thoughts on climate risk and investing. So Bob.
Well, thanks, George and, and uh, Barbara and uh, the whole uh, IEN uh, uh, steering committee and network. Uh, it's great to be here again. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the thing about my approach here, I'm, I'm a risk management guy. I spent 23 years on Wall Street. Uh, I, I had an economics degree, but I was lucky enough to come at a time when quants were in short supply on Wall Street. And... Uh, I became the head of risk management at Goldman Sachs. Uh, I only turned to climate more recently. Uh, maybe it was about 10 years ago, one of my partners uh, asked me what I was going to do when I retired. I said, well, I hadn't even thought about it. And, uh, but he recruited me at that time to the uh, board of the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, and now I've joined many boards, uh, Resources for the Future and the Global Institute of Sustainability. Uh, I suppose the IEN network, you might say, a, a number of uh, many too many of these. Uh, but what I really have been focusing on is, uh, is thinking about climate risk and thinking about it from a risk management perspective. And, uh, and that perspective uh, caused me to start thinking uh, about the economics of climate risk and, uh, and to come to what I think are some uh, important insights about the transition to a low carbon economy. And so really that's what I'm gonna be talking about and it, and, and it really uh, focuses on pricing risk. Uh, you know, when you think about risk management, uh, most people, if you ask what is, uh, what is the role of risk management, uh, they would probably think it's to manage risk. Uh, but the, the reality is uh, it's not really about managing risk, the risk manager in a, uh, in a financial institution for sure, which is really where I think the risk management uh, industry, well, there's some people who think of insurance as risk management and there's various other kinds of risk management, but in financial risk management, the issue is not minimizing risk and it's not up to the risk manager to manage risk, it's really more a job of measurement and identifying risks and sizing risks and, and understanding how to quantify those risks. And as an investor, if you think about what you're trying to do, you're looking for risks that are not priced appropriately. If you're getting paid a lot of money for a small risk, that's an opportunity, you wanna take it. And if there's risks where there's a lot of risk but you're not getting paid for them, well, that's something you wanna avoid or maybe you wanna sell that risk, let someone else uh, uh, take it on. But uh, but climate risk, at the end of the day, we're not pricing it at all. Uh, and when I talk about climate risk, you can really think about that as the price of emissions. And emissions today, as you know, are, are, they're priced in certain venues around the world. Most venues uh, are not pricing emissions. And in fact, if you think about pricing emissions more generally as the incentives that are created by society to uh, restrict the amount of emissions that are created, the incentives around most of the world are to produce uh, emissions from fossil fuels. Consumption and production of fossil fuels is heavily subsidized. The International Energy Agency estimates about 500 billion of subsidies every year to fossil fuel consumption and production. Uh, and then in all the venues where we uh, actually tax emissions, it's like a total of 22 billion. So they're not commensurate at all. There are globally incentives, huge incentives, to produce more emissions. So if you think about, in that context, the transition to a low carbon economy, it hasn't really gotten started. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think it really has gotten started and, and I'll talk about some of the uh, evidence that it has. But I want to start out with a, a story. It's a true story. It occurred uh, to my wife and I. Uh, I sometimes call it the truck on fire story. It occurred about a year ago. We were uh, on our way driving into New York City for a, a play and a dinner with some friends on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, and we, uh, it was pouring rain. And you know, the old cliche about uh, it, it's true, I don't remember anything that happened, I don't remember what I was thinking about until my wife exclaimed, oh my God, Bob, watch out. 
and the tone of her voice told me it was something very serious. And I looked up and I saw in the distance a truck coming at us. We were in the uh, freeway going eastbound. This was a uh, truck on the freeway going westbound. Big 18-wheeler, it was kind of bouncing. I'd never seen anything like this, out of control clearly, and on fire. And uh, so I immediately uh, kind of thought, well, it's coming straight. I'm going straight. I'm probably okay. There's a, sh a small concrete barrier between the two sides of the freeway. I hope that that's, it was about three feet tall. I hope that's tall enough that if that truck comes this way, it'll bounce off. Um, now, what I didn't realize was that truck had already been in an accident. It had uh, crushed a car way over on the, uh, uh, the lanes uh, on the far side, the uh, local lanes, uh, and had bounced across those local lanes, across the median, into the express lanes, and it wasn't coming straight down the expressway. It was coming straight at us. The other thing I didn't know is it was actually a tanker uh, with 9,000 gallons of gasoline. And uh, let's see, I think if I can go forward here. Uh, this is a picture that uh, someone took. So we were on the far side of this coming this way. And uh, what happened is that truck went right up, hit the barrier, went over the barrier, and landed right in front of us and burst into flames. Uh, I, of course, slammed on the brakes when I saw it coming. We slowed down, I looked over, there was no one on my right. I was able to swerve and was probably going by that flaming debris. In fact, it had just, I mean, it happened literally a second before we got there. So there was still debris bouncing across the road. Uh, the car was splattered with oil and the heat, even though we were probably going about 15, 20 miles an hour as we went by it, was uh, incredibly intense. Now, the reason I tell you this story, it's not because uh, it's about driving. It, it's to me, and you know, I'm, I'm sure other people wouldn't draw the same conclusion, but to me, it's very much about climate risk. We are at the point as a society, as a global society, where in this story, my wife exclaims, oh my God, watch out. That's, that's the danger that we face now. And the lesson that I want you to take away is that when you have potential for catastrophic impacts, and you know, risk management requires consideration of worst case scenarios. When you have catastrophic impacts, you don't ease on the brakes. You slam on the brakes. You slam hard enough that you hopefully can assure yourself that you're gonna survive. You know, when I saw that truck coming at us, I didn't ease on the brakes. If I'd eased on the brakes, I wouldn't be here today. You never know how much time you might have. And we don't know how much time we have. Now, what that tells me, well, first of all, what it tells me is that we should immediately slam on the brakes. And what are the brakes? It's very clear what the break is. The break is the incentive that we provide to each other, to everyone in society globally, to reduce their emissions. There should be one global price for emissions that should reflect the ex economic externality, the, the economic value of the risk that is created by emissions. That, as an economist, that's just very obvious. It's Econ 101. Now, if you ask, what is that incentive? How big is it? That's a very difficult question to answer. Um, intuitively, it's large enough that we can be assured that we're gonna solve this problem. And actually, in a global context, it's not that big. It's, you know, we're doing nothing now. Right now, globally, our foot is still on the accelerator. And the question, the only real question of interest is how hard should we be hitting the brake? 
And, I, you know, various, uh, that's really a question for economists and scientists working together. Uh, and I'm trying to do uh, some work with scientists and economists because, to be honest, the economic models aren't very good. We don't have a good answer to that question. But I would say most uh, of the serious work suggests, at least to me, that a range of about 50 to to $100 a ton is the appropriate range for emissions. Now, where does that come from? Well, the first, it has to come from science. We have to measure the risk. Um, I want to, there was a, uh, a good study that was done about a year ago by the uh, AAAS, the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, and it was done not for other scientists, which is usually what the Academy uh, communicates to, but it was done for the public, and it was a, a report that they uh, created. It was called What We Know. You can find it easily if you look it up on the web, AAAS, uh, What We Know. And what they said is, I'm just going to read a few uh, uh, sentences what they said. We consider it to be our responsibility as professionals to ensure to the best of our ability that people understand what we know. Human-caused climate change is happening. We face risks of abrupt, unpredictable, and potentially irreversible changes with highly damaging impacts, and responding now will lower the risk and cost of taking action. They go on to say, the Earth's climate is on a path to warm beyond the range of what has been experienced over the past millions of years. The range of uncertainty for the warming along the current emissions path is wide enough to encompass massively disruptive consequences to societies and ecosystems. As global temperatures rise, there is real risk, however small, that one or more critical parts of the Earth's climate system will experience abrupt, unpredictable, and potentially irreversible changes. The report continues, disturbingly, scientists do not know how much warming is required to trigger such changes to the climate system. Now, if that doesn't scare everyone to death here, I don't think you understood what I just said. This is the scientists telling us there's a truck coming at us and it's out of control. And it is time to slam on the brakes and that is to price emissions. And uh, you know, my, what I've been doing for the last five years is trying to you know, get society somehow, global society, to listen. And uh, I'm not used to, you know, one of the things you learn as a risk manager is that you actually have the trump card, at least within an organization like uh, where I worked, Goldman Sachs. If you went to the head of a business uh, or the head of a trading desk, let's say, and said, you know, you guys are over your limit, they didn't have, the, well, I never experienced one saying, well, I'm sorry, this is a great opportunity. But if they'd said that, I would then go to the next person up the chain. And, you know, uh, when it's a risk management issue, I never had the experience of someone saying, eh, come back next week. You know, a risk management issue, particularly when there's potentially catastrophic outcomes, is something you have to take seriously and you have to address immediately. Now, the good news is, I think society is starting to address it. Um, it's, it's starting to recognize that there is an uncertain amount of capacity in the atmosphere. Uh, to, uh, to safely absorb emissions. The, the trouble is we don't know how much that capacity is. I like to sometimes say, think of it, think of the atmosphere as like a reservoir, and we're filling it up. Uh, the level you can measure in terms of the, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's a nice simple way to think about it. The historical level was 280 parts per million, so you can kind of think of that as the, the level of the reservoir. It's rising. It's now up to 400. Uh, we don't really know. I think the, the right way to think about it, because obviously we're already seeing impacts, but forget about the sort of small impacts. The, the question is, when does that first irreversible catastrophic impact occur? Think of that as the level we have to worry about. You know, sometimes I tell the story, I'm not going to go through it now, of the Johnstown Flood. Some of you may know the story of the Johnstown Flood. It happened in 1886. If you don't know it, I suggest 
you find out about it. There's plenty of good books about it. But that was a case where, you know, they filled up this old reservoir. They didn't worry about it. There were lots of warnings. And then it flooded. And when it overflowed, the whole thing came down. I mean, it, it just, there were positive feedbacks and uh, wiped out Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Thousands of people died. It was, it was horrible. The same thing, we don't know when there's going to be a tipping point, but at some point, if we keep putting carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we're going to cross that point. We may not know it at the time. It may not happen for a long time, but it may lead to irreversible uh, damages that may be catastrophic. It, it reminds me a little bit of what happened in the financial crisis, where we put all these mortgages on balance sheets. We thought they were safe. We just piled them up until we realized, oh, they're not safe. And it was too late to prevent the meltdown of the financial system. So in the, in the context of climate, we don't know how much capacity is left. And whatever capacity is remaining, right now we're wasting it. We're not even, we should think of that remaining capacity as a scarce resource. We should be pricing it. We should be allocating it efficiently. And again, as an economist, the only interesting question is kind of, you know, what is that right price? Uh, I kind of, you know, here suggest how you might think about uh, a reasonable range for emissions pricing. And what I want to do, is, so this has a chart with time on the horizontal axis, uh, prices per ton of carbon dioxide on the vertical axis, and, you know, there's kind of a, a, a large degree of uncertainty. It would be nice to narrow that down. Uh, I, I would say uh, economists and scientists are trying to come up with better models. But, um, but really, the, if you don't know, and, and because there's so much uncertainty about the models, about the science, you have to be cautious. And that means you have to be at the high end. If you have a break in your car and you don't know how well it works, you know, you're going to press it harder. Uh, and, uh, and so that, to me, tells me we really need to be kind of at the upper end of this. The good news is the upper end is not, if, if it's 100 or $150 a ton, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, at $100 a ton, a dollar a gallon of gasoline. At 150, roughly speaking, a dollar and a half a gallon of gasoline. That's less than the price drop we've seen in gasoline in the last year. This is not that expensive. In, in my uh, dreams, I think we're just going to price it and no one will notice, you know? It's like I, I read an article where uh, it said Bill Gates thinks of it as a bug in the global operating system which, you know, in some sense is very much true. We could change tax codes around the world. Most people wouldn't even notice if you didn't tell them. And all of a sudden, the price system would direct everyone in the right direction. You know, whether you're a consumer, uh, an entrepreneur, an investor, uh, in business, you, you, you respond to incentives. Uh, people sometimes say, oh, Bob, you're an economist. You believe people are rational. I said, I don't believe people are rational. I said, you know, my dog didn't know why, but it responded to incentives, you know? It's, you don't have to be rational. You just respond to incentives. I, I got interested in that. My undergraduate major was human biology. We're all, you know, we're all organisms. We all respond uh, very similarly to these things. And as an economist, you realize the price system, it's, it's like a... It's like a physical field that people respond to unconsciously without even knowing. And so when we have the wrong incentives, as we do in the world today, people make the wrong decisions. And you can try and change behavior through regulation or you know, education or whatever, but it's like pushing water upstream. You, you make the wrong decisions because you don't control the inputs that go into the electric system. You don't control, you don't, you just, you don't know how, do you eat chicken or do you eat beef? How much carbon dioxide is embedded? You just don't have the information to make the right decisions. We have to build it in. And not putting it in the price system is kind of insane. Now, 
Luckily, I think that's changing and changing quickly. Um, the problem is it hasn't changed quick enough. And you know, I, as I mentioned, I'm relatively new to this space. I've only been working in it for less than 10 years. There are people who've been working on this problem for 30 years. It's a tough problem to solve. It's a problem that has a lot of frictions. Most people are very short-term oriented, even investors as we know. Uh, most people are uh, you know, consumed with other things. This isn't that important to them. We don't have a global governance structure that's adequate to the task. Uh, it's not something that any one country can address or it, it doesn't seem to work that way because there's a free rider problem. It makes no sense for anyone to go first if people aren't gonna follow. And, and Europe figured this out. Um, you know, they went first, they've been pricing emissions for a long time. If no one else does it, you're kind of uh, hurting yourself. And, and uh, it, how do you get everyone to move together? It's, it's a very difficult problem, uh, you know, and, and it's gotten very tangled up with income inequality, which sadly then becomes a friction because you know, we're not gonna solve income inequality anytime soon. We've got to price emissions immediately. So a lot of people think, well, you know, you should have a different price for wealthy countries versus poor countries. And there's a lot of political disagreement about this. I think in the UN speak, it's called common but differentiated responsibilities. Sorting through that is a nightmare. And the answer, by the way, is very simple to an economist. Now, you know, maybe this isn't very practical, but if, uh, if you have a poor country, you know, there's one question is, what do you do about that poverty? How do you address poverty? Maybe you provide housing or food or infrastructure. A lot of things that can be done, should be done, aren't being done, but you don't subsidize pollution. That's the, in, in effect, by charging a lower price over here than over here, what you're saying is, well, you're poor, we're gonna subsidize your pollution. Because even though it does the same damage, it doesn't matter where that ton of carbon dioxide comes from, uh, it should be priced the same. And now, if you take the revenues from pricing emissions, you can address those income inequality problems. But, uh, well, that's somehow not how people think. And so that has become a very big friction in the, uh, in the UN process. Uh, now, I have some ideas for uh, how to get around that, and I'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, they're moving forward very nicely, and that is that there's actually uh, a globally harmonized emissions price being designed today. Most people don't know that, even those who work in this space. It's being designed in the uh, aviation industry. Aviation, it turns out, is a global um, uh, industry. It has a very strong governance structure. It's called ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. It's part of the UN formally, but it's really very separate. And it's really run by the aviation industry for its own purposes. So, I don't know, it was about three years ago, the EU decided they were gonna try and include emissions from aircraft in their uh, trading system. The uh, aviation industry said, no, nope, can't do that because we want one globally harmonized regulatory structure. We don't want different regions or countries uh, establishing different regulatory regimes on aviation. So the aviation industry got the US to uh, join with China, Russia, a few other nice actors and threaten a uh, a, a trade war with Europe. China actually canceled a bunch of, or threatened to cancel a bunch of uh, Airbus orders. That was led by the United States. In fact, most people don't realize that was the most bipartisan legislation that came out of the Obama administration. There wasn't one Democrat or Republican who uh, opposed what was called the Thune Bill. The reasoning was completely bizarre, at least to an economist, uh, the, the, I listened to some of the uh, testimony in Congress. The senators said, well, Europe has promised to take the revenues from this tax and use them for emissions reductions, but we're not comfortable that they can guarantee that. There might be leakage. 
Are you kidding me? That's not the point. You're trying to create incentives. But anyway, it, was, it really had nothing to do with that. It's just the power of the aviation industry. They're very powerful. Now, they will tell you that they're very green and that they have, uh, they're going to use some biofuels, that they're going to get more efficient aircraft, uh, that they're going to uh, more, be more efficient about um, circling, less circling around, aircraft, uh, around airports and so on. And if necessary, in order to reach their voluntary target of no emissions increase post-2020, then they will use this market-based measure that they're designing. They will buy offsets and credits. Their intention is to have a plentiful supply of offsets and credits so that it really doesn't cost much. It's, it's totally greenwashing. And so what we've decided to do at WWF is to organize investors. Investors have a long time horizon. So, you know, I, I, I used to be a, uh, an advisor to the Singapore government. Uh, they're a GIC, Government Investment Corporation. It's their sovereign fund, one of the largest sovereign funds in the world. They were always talking about investments on behalf of future generations. And, and I love that. That's really what they were thinking about. And, you know, the long-term investors that we have, sovereign funds, pension funds, educational endowments, and uh, other foundations and religious institutions, those are the folks who have the long horizon to think about these issues seriously. And what we're trying to do is to organize them to engage with the aviation industry and just say, look, you're in the process of designing the world's first globally harmonized emissions price. Don't you think it ought to be set appropriately and intentionally? And shouldn't that become the benchmark for global pricing of emissions? And, uh, well, not too many people were listening. We've been uh, on this kick for a few years. But I will tell you, just a few months ago, we got a big supporter, uh, MIT. Uh, they haven't announced this publicly, but they've, uh, they've said they're not going to divest, but they've also committed the university to do a lot of good things on climate. And one of the things that they're doing is they're supporting this initiative. So we're now working with them, working with global investors. So just wanted to uh, mention that and, uh, and, and let you know about that. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is the transition to a low-carbon environment, um, uh, low-carbon economy. So when is that going to happen? Well, I think it's happening. Although I told you we aren't pricing emissions yet. The foot is still on the accelerator. There is a market signal that tells me that the market expects that price to come sooner and at higher levels than has been anticipated. And that is in this graph here. What is this graph? This is the total return since we put on, uh, at the beginning of 2014, what we called a stranded asset total return swap, we being the World Wildlife Fund. So the back story here is, oh, about two years ago, uh, the, uh, the board of the World Wildlife Fund got very focused on what should we be doing with our endowment. And, uh, you know, should we divest of fossil fuels? Uh, and so we, you know, we talked about it. And I said, you know, I, I like to make a distinction between fossil fuels and stranded assets. Uh, the concept stranded assets uh, comes from, I don't know where it originates, but there's a program, a stranded asset program at, uh, in the Smith School of Oxford University in the UK. Uh, I first heard about it from a white paper written by uh, the folks at Generation Investment Management, which you probably many of you know is headed by David Blood and Al Gore. David's an old friend of mine who used to work for him at uh, Goldman. And I, I read their white paper, and it talked about stranded assets. And I thought, you know, that's, that's a very important concept. It's, 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 it's not um, fossil fuels. It's assets whose valuation will be negatively impacted by appropriate pricing of emissions. And you might say overvalued assets, because the pricing of emissions, and it's not really the pricing of emissions, I should be careful when I talk, it's expectations of future pricing of emissions 
will cause the valuations of those assets to drop to their true level. Those assets are overvalued in the sense that they are creating an economic externality that's not being recognized. So as investors anticipate that that externality will be uh, priced, then the valuations of those assets will drop to their true value. And we're seeing that happen in the marketplace. What we decided to do is to focus on stranded assets, and we defined those, at least initially, as coal and tar sands. And we looked in our portfolio, and, well, you might not be surprised to find what we found was we had less than 1% of our uh, assets. And we, and we have a small, uh, we, we sometimes call it endowment. It's really a reserve fund, uh, and it's, it's designed to cover periods if we don't get enough funding. Uh, we're not trying to build up a, a, a big endowment. And, um, and, and so we had a, a small amount, less than 1%. Actually, most of that was in one uh, real resource category, which when we thought about it, we thought, why are we holding real resources? This is an inflation hedge. I'm not sure we need that. And uh, so we got rid of that, uh, a real resource fund, and now we were down to about a quarter of a percent. And uh, we decided, all right, let's eliminate those from our portfolio. Well, our consultant said, first of all, it's a tiny amount. Secondly, it's scattered amongst all your investments. You've got some in private equity. You've got some in hedge funds. You've got some in public equities. You know, we don't manage our assets ourselves. They're managed by third parties. They said, you're going to have to turn over, you know, three quarters of your portfolio. It's going to cost you an arm and a leg. Why don't you just ignore that? We said, well, we're not comfortable ignoring it. Let's come up with a better solution. Can we hedge that asset risk? Now, we were looking at it uh, earlier today. There was a talk about values versus value. We were looking at this from a value perspective. Uh, at WWF, we, we have a lot of values that are built into our mission and built into our program. But in the investment side, we just said, we want to hedge the risk of these stranded assets. And so our consultant, it was Cambridge, said, you know, we can, uh, we can hedge that through a derivative structure where you don't have to sell the underlying assets. We can sell those in an overlay. Uh, and so this is a very simple, it's a derivative. It's called a swap. And what it is is basically you're making a bet that stranded assets are going to underperform the market. You're long the market, in this case the S&P 500, your short stranded assets. In this case, we came up with an index of coal, three quarters uh, coal and one quarter tar sands. And, uh, and, and I like it, uh, number one, because it's very inexpensive. We didn't, didn't have to touch the underlying portfolio. Number two, it's very transparent what it is. It's basically a bet that stranded assets are gonna underperform the market. And I thought, well, that's a pretty good bet. And then number three, it, it reduces your risk. So from a fiduciary perspective, it eliminates all of the excuses that you might have not to do something. It, it reduces your risk. It hedges those stranded assets. It has a positive expected return if you think stranded assets are going to underperform the market. And we are going to price emissions. And, uh, and, and it aligns. Uh, in our case, it aligns our portfolio with our mission. Uh, and uh, so that's what we did. And now, having put it on at the beginning of January, we kind of watched not much happened for the first three or four months. Uh, and, you know, I, to be honest, I wasn't expecting much to happen. I just thought in the long run, this will probably uh, do well as stranded assets underperform. Well, in, uh, in May, uh, Stanford announced it was going to divest of coal. Now, I was very pleased with that. In fact, I'm an alum of Stanford, and uh, when they were debating it, they invited me to get involved. I went out and I talked to, uh, there was a student faculty staff uh, committee that was advising the board. Uh, I talked to the uh, head of the uh, Stanford management company who told me, you know, we'll do whatever the board says. We're happy to comply. And, and, uh, and so we, we talked a lot about stranded assets. The uh, recommendation to the board was that they 
uh, divest of uh, coal, and they went along with that. And uh, the only thing that disappointed me is they didn't say we're investing stranded assets because emissions should be priced and they're overvalued. I, I would have preferred that message. They just said we're divesting of coal because it's the right thing to do. Well, you can see that that announcement just about is this point where this stranded asset swap hit its minimum. And then from that point forward, it's done very well. I like to point to uh, the next uh, event which occurred, which was that August, uh, Yale decided after a long discussion, again, I was involved in advising both the students and uh, the committee that was uh, making the decision. I, I tried to tell them both you should focus on stranded assets, but the students didn't want to stop talking about divestment. And the, uh, the faculty group that was advising uh, the corporation didn't want to make a deal. And uh, so they decided we're not going to divest. But at the same time, they did understand that they wanted to make a very strong statement, which they did, that climate change is real, that it affects everything in, that they do at the university and, and that they do in their endowment. And so at the same time they made that announcement, the uh, CIO of the Yale Endowment, David Swenson, who most of you probably know is one of the most uh, respected investors in the world, uh, and, and well-deserved, he wrote a letter to all of his external managers, a very strongly worded letter, saying that climate change is real, it's gonna affect the valuation of all the assets that we own, and we want you to take that into account when you make investments on behalf of Yale. I thought it was terrific, and in fact, we uh, republished that letter later in the Financial Analyst Journal where I'm, I was the executive editor. So it's, it's out there now in public, you can read that if you want. I think that sent a very significant message to the investment community. And after that message, this swap has performed amazingly well, re reflecting again the underperformance of coal and tar sands relative to the S&P 500. Many people understand that coal has underperformed. I'm not sure people understand how the valuations of coal have collapsed. One of the biggest uh, uh, companies in our portfolio in this swap was Peabody Coal. We were short Peabody. When we put it on, I talked to some of my friends uh, in investment banking from Goldman. They said, well, Bob, you know, coal is very cheap. It had, it had come down a lot. Seven years ago, Peabody Coal was uh, over $1,300 um, per share. Today, it's 15. So it's come down almost 99%. That's how much the valuation of these coal companies. On average, well, this swap has returned 75% since we put it on two years ago, and these assets were considered cheap at that time. So, in fact, the swap I went back before we put it on and did a, uh, an analysis in the three years prior, it had outperformed by about 16% per year so it's been performing very well, and I would say the performance has only accelerated. And in fact, uh, one of the next events that occurred is uh, in November of last year, uh, Saudi Arabia surprised OPEC by saying, we're not gonna cut production in the face of a global glut of oil. Now it turns out my friends at Carbon Tracker told me they'd been to the Middle East and talked to everyone out there. So I think the Middle East understands the carbon bubble argument. And by the way, whether they understand it or not, let's just be very clear. If you're Saudi Arabia and you have a huge reservoir of oil and you think, well, there's a shortage of oil and I can either sell it now or I can sell it in the future, then if the price gets too low, you're gonna say, all right, we'll sell it in the future. That's always the trade-off that you're thinking about. How do I maximize the net present value of my, my reservoir of oil? Well, if you come to the realization that the scarce resource is not oil, the scarce resource is the atmosphere's capacity to safely absorb emissions, then you're not gonna pull your oil off the market in order to sell it later because you know that you may not be able to sell it later. 
what you're going to do is take market share. So what Saudi Arabia is doing and did last November is perfectly understandable. It, you don't have to think of it as being an attempt to meet short-term, uh, uh, you know, people give a lot of excuses why Saudi Arabia is doing what they're doing. They, they need to, uh, you know, increase uh, subsidies or support or something, or they're attacking uh, the Iranians or the uh, Russians or, or the U.S. Uh, they're going to they're gonna cause this uh, shale revolution to uh, collapse and then they're going to jack the price up. No, they're just taking market share because that's how they maximize the value of their wealth. And what does that mean? That means this is not a cyclical low for oil prices. This is a permanent new reality based on the fact that we don't have the capacity to store those emissions in the atmosphere. And so what does that mean? That means that people who are in the business of producing oil at $80 a barrel are not going to be in business. And you saw Shell recently cancel their uh, Arctic drilling. They pulled out of uh, tar sands. Uh, so personally, I think this swap has a long way to go. Now, I will say you should be uh, very skeptical because I'm now making a market. I'm telling you, I think better, I know better than the market does where these stranded assets are. And it's easy to go back and say, wow, it's performed very well over the last year and a half. It's a lot harder to say what it's gonna do in the future. But having said that, I would just say, I don't think you have to worry about, as a fiduciary, you know, uh, am I gonna hurt the performance of my portfolio by uh, reducing the exposure to uh, stranded assets. I think that's something that's uh, perfectly defensible and in fact likely to be a, a, a good bet. Uh, so anyway, uh, with that, I think I'll stop and take some questions if we have time. There's, there's yeah, microphones out girl. there. Uh, thank you very much, Bob. Just curious to see um, if you know what happened in the wake of the Keystone XL announcement as well. Um, in terms of the swap? Yeah. This is, yeah, this is up to date uh, from, from maybe a day ago. So, and I don't know. The, uh, I, I updated it. It was up about a percent today, yesterday, not yesterday, Friday. Um, but uh, so Keystone wasn't a big event. You know, actually, it's, it's funny. Some of these things like the Republican victory, I didn't mention all the different events that I've noted there. But when the Republicans took the Congress last November, people thought, oh, this will be great for oil and gas. And there was a slight bump. You can barely see it on this graph. But uh, you know, there was not, there, the market didn't do much. What's, what's been driving the market lately, and there are a couple of, you know, it's been kind of flat now for uh, a few months. There was an announcement that uh, Soros was buying coal because it was very cheap. And, uh, you know, it is very cheap. <laughs> but, uh, so that caused uh, a little bit of negative. And then there was a, a takeover bid on the, uh, an oil sands company. So that was another, blip, uh, but, uh, and then there was something in the paper today about uh, 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 David uh, Einhorn buying more of uh, Console Energy. It, it did point out that he bought quite a bit when it was 79% higher than where it is today, so it's a lot cheaper today. Uh, but anyway, so there, you know, there's risk in all these things, and there are impacts day to day, but uh, boy, if you had told me a year and a half ago that this swap would return 80% in the next year and a half. I, I just, that was beyond my wildest dream. So again, just to put it in the broader perspective, this is the market telling you it expects that we are going to price emissions. And, and it understands we've got to slam on the brakes. And so as investors, you should be preparing your portfolios for that. 
This is not time for business as usual. This is time to invest in the new low carbon economy. Oh, let me, that reminds me, let me tell you something about Exxon Mobil. Uh, so the last time, or not the last time, but at the Hampshire uh, College uh, sponsored event, I guess that was the first intentionally designed endowment uh, dinner like this. Um, I was talking to uh, Natasha Lamb from As You Sew, and some of you may know that they, uh, they sponsored an initiative, a, a shareholder engagement with Exxon, where they, uh, uh, well, I forget all the steps, but eventually Exxon said, look, in exchange for your withdrawing this uh, shareholder um, uh, initiative, we're going to issue a report about the valuation of our stranded assets. And so uh, they did produce this report. This was about a year ago. And uh, when I saw the report, I thought, this is ridiculous. And it was ridiculous. They basically said, there is no stranded asset risk in our portfolio because it's too expensive to move to a low carbon economy. That's never going to happen. And then they quoted this MIT study as showing that it would cost 44% of income. No government is ever going to do that. It would be insane. That was their basic answer. By the way, the question wasn't, is government going to move to a low carbon economy scenario? The question was, what's going to happen to the value of your assets if this happens? Their answer was, there's no risk. It'll never happen. It'll cost 44% of income. That was a huge lie. That's what that was. And it was a lie to shareholders about the valuation of their assets. I don't think that's legal. I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think that's legal. Now, what is it actually going to cost? It'll cost maybe 1%. If you get to the $150 price where you slam on the brakes, maybe that's 1.5% of income. And that's the most expensive. You're slamming on the brakes, meaning you expect you're going to solve this problem and it's going to cost less in the future, not more. Okay? That's the reality. It's not that expensive. That's an important reality for the public to understand. It's not 44% of income. Can you imagine Exxon telling its shareholders, don't worry about our stranded assets. It's too expensive. It'll cost 44% of median income. Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Kevin Brennan from Equilibrium. I was wondering how closely you're watching the development of uh, the UN carbon pricing framework and any expectations ahead of the Paris talks. Well, I'm, I'm watching it, and um, I'm very optimistic that we're going to get global pricing of emissions, but it's not going to happen at Paris. Uh, you know, the... The UN process has been hopelessly uh, dysfunctional for decades, and my view of what's happened in Paris is the whole process has lowered the bar so low that they can step over it. So all the countries made voluntary, you know, uh, INDCs, what is that? Uh, I forget, someone knows what that acronym is, but anyway, voluntary commitment, not commitments, uh, voluntary pledges, I don't know what they are, to reduce their emissions. They're not binding, they're not in any framework, you know, the U.S. says we're going to lower emissions some percent relative to something, China says we're, our emissions are going to peak in some years, someone else says something else, someone else says something else, you add it all up. The good news is it's, it's a big change from business as usual. But to be honest, business as usual is always a crazy benchmark. We're not, you know, business is not going to continue as usual. We're going to address this issue. We are going to move to a low carbon environment, a low carbon economy. And the only question is, is it soon enough? And when are we, you know, when are we going to do it? How high are we going to price emissions? The pricing of emissions is not going to happen in Paris. That's very clear. It's not even on the plate. But what Paris is going to do is it's an important step toward a public recognition that there is a truck coming straight at us and it's on fire. 
And at some point soon, we're going to realize we have to slam on the brakes. Now, I think the World Bank is probably leading in the uh, initiative to create a, uh, a price on emissions. Unfortunately, what the World Bank has recognized is that there, it's not going to happen through a, uh, what they call a top-down agreement. There's not going to be a top-down agreement. They've given up on that. So it's going to come from bottoms up individual venues creating emissions prices, and the World Bank is hoping to somehow tie those together. Now that's a really, really difficult thing to do. And so this is not an easy problem to solve. In fact, I was at a, a very depressing meeting of the World Bank about a year ago where they went through this whole scenario. They said, we've all agreed, and this was uh, a, a, uh, a conference sponsored by the World Bank, but everyone was there, the US government, European governments, NGOs, and so there were probably 100 people sitting around a table. They all agreed. There's not going to be a top-down agreement. Paris is going to come up with basically a meaningless set of pledges. And then what are we going to do in a post-Paris world? And the answer was, well, we're going to somehow try and get as many venues as possible to price emissions. The World Bank, by the way, doesn't really agree with me that there should be a globally harmonized emissions price. I think they'll figure that out over time. Uh, and then somehow they're going to try and tie these all together. Well. You know, that's a, and so they were looking for ideas. How do you tie them all together? It's a very, very tough problem. Anyway, so. Uh, actually, no, Kevin actually st stole my question. It was along the same lines. But Bob, a terrific presentation. Um, just to kind of maybe interject a little bit of positivity in regards to the upcoming climate negotiations, isn't it also interesting to take note that as we speak, there are 40 countries around the world that have either implemented a carbon tax or a carbon emissions trading scheme or some combination of both. Uh, in addition to that, there are 25 provinces and states that have moved forward um, with carbon pricing mechanisms um, parallel to that. Um, and all indications are that the number of countries and or the number of states and provinces uh, after Paris is going to expand. Oh, uh, absolutely, would you, absolutely. Would you, could you please comment on, on, on yeah. the, perhaps the hope that not only that trend indicates, but also the business community. Uh, maybe in, in, in comparison to previous climate change negotiations, the business community is, is going to be represented pretty strongly, and there's some pretty, uh, pretty stiff pre-negotiated commitments uh, from the global multinationals. Absolutely. I'm sorry if I sounded, you know, depressed or pessimistic. I am not. I look at this and I say the market is not stupid. The market sees it coming. It is coming. And as you mentioned, you can, you can paint a, a glass half full or a glass half empty picture. Uh, there is a lot of commitment. I think what's going to happen is post Paris, there's going to be a focus on how do we get a global price. And you're going to see states, uh, I think you're going to see it in aviation. I think you're going to see they're already, you know, aviation's already agreed to create a globally harmonized price. It's just the details are being worked out. So my plan is, well, let's get investors to engage with the aviation industry, by the way, whose interest is to lead the effort. One of the problems is how do you get everyone to move together? And the answer is start with aviation. It's global. And it needs the capacity to create emissions. It's a scarce resource that other people are wasting. So of course they should move first. And once we get a benchmark price and an intentionally designed benchmark price, that's a key part of this. You know, you don't want the politicians involved. You want the scientists and the economists to say, how hard are you going to slam on the brakes? Do you really trust the politicians to get that right? This is too important. We really have to take it away from the politicians, give it over to the experts, and say, tell us where to price emissions. And I think we can do that in aviation, and then I think we can get all the countries in the world and all the other industries on board. So I think this is happening. It's coming soon, and when we get that price, boy, we can stop worrying about everything else. You know, entrepreneurs, investors, 
all those things, all those issues, how do we get resources flowing where we need them? Those go away because the market system is now your friend rather than your enemy. So I'm absolutely optimistic this is happening. I see it happening. And, you know, that's my message to you. Get prepared for it in your investments. Thank you, Bob, very much. Thank you.